Okay. Yes. All right. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I'm your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event, um, as we call ourselves. Uh, we're a webinar, a webcast, an online show. Um, there's lots of uh, discussion, if you're into this kind of thing, about what we call these. Some people like certain terms, some people hate certain terminology. <laughs> but um, whatever you want to call us, as long as it's something good, we are here live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time for you to watch the show. Um, we do record the show every week, so if you are unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. You can go to our website and see all of our recordings there, and I'll show you where that is at the end of today's show. Um, we have the recording there. We, if there's any presentations or handouts or documents related to a session, we post links to those. And any websites that are mentioned throughout a show, we do collect and put into our delicious, delicious account for the commission or we link out to where um, presenters sometimes have set these things up. So if there is anything during the show that's a long URL or some website, um, don't worry about trying to scribble it all down yourself while you're watching the show. Just pay attention to what we're doing, we're, you know, the talk, and you'll have all that information um, given to you afterwards when the recording is available. Um, both the show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch, so please do share with any of your friends, colleagues, relatives, anyone you know that might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show, send them to our website and have them join us on Wednesdays or watch recordings. Uh, we do a mixture of things here in the show, uh, book reviews, mini training sessions, um, interviews, demos. Uh, basically, our only criteria is that it's somehow library related. So um, something libraries are actually doing, um, projects, programs are doing, anything that libraries, um, resources that libraries could use, um, new, new different things that could be done at libraries. So um, you might see some topics that you wouldn't know why they're on there, um, but, you know, uh, trust us, <laughs> when you get into these shows, you'll see everything links back to having something to do with libraries. Might be a little bit more broad, a little outside the box thinking, but um, that's really our only criteria. Um, we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes do presentations on programs and things that we're doing here, but we also bring in guest speakers, and that's what we have this morning with us. To my left, um, we have Megan Boggs, who's from Seward Memorial Library here in Nebraska, and uh, Joseph Chapman, who's from Geneva Public Library, also from Nebraska, just um, west-ish west of us here in Lincoln, <laughs> um, and they came in this morning. Um, to talk about um, making the most of Maker Camp at your library. You've heard of um, Maker Spaces, Maker Fairs, and now Maker Camp is like another way of um, doing that same similar kind of thing. But I'm just going to hand it over to them to let you guys tell us all about what you've been doing at your libraries with this. That's great. Thank you, Krista. Okay. Um, as she said, I am Joseph Chapman. Um, I plan and supervise Maker Camp at the Geneva Public Library. Um, we have been running Maker Camp sessions since summer of 2015. Um, we became affiliated with Maker Camp then, and we were lucky enough to get a supply box. Um, we ran sessions throughout July and August last year. We also did some in the fall. Um, in 2016, we have done some in March, and now we are currently doing some in August. Um, on average, we have about five to ten campers, and they are between grades fifth and eighth, although we do tend to extend on both sides of that range. All right, and um, like Krista said, I'm Megan Boggs from the Seward Memorial Library, and we started offering Maker Camp programs in the summer of 2014. Um, we applied as an affiliate for the official Maker Camp that at that time was co-sponsored by Make Magazine and Google, um, and you can get more information about that um, official Maker Camp at their website, which is makercamp.com, um, but that's six weeks summer program that we started in 2014 really got us going and we've been offering maker programs throughout the year since then. Um, we typically offer programs for elementary and middle school age students and average 10 to 15 kids per session. So the first thing that we're going to talk a little bit about is the importance of planning for a maker camp. Um, one of the first things we like to do is determine our target audience. Um, most of our maker programs in Seward have been ge geared towards elementary, middle school, and sometimes high school age children. However, we have offered a few maker programs for adults that have been very well received. 
Um, so it's important to first decide which group um, or groups you'd like to reach through the maker camps at your library. And then once you've figured that out, you can proceed from there. Yeah, once you've figured out your target audience, you can sort of proceed with finding a time and date that works for your group. Um, we do it on a regular weekly basis. We schedule ours for Thursdays at 4. We find that this time works whether kids are in school or out of school. As if they're in school, it's right after they get out, so they're already coming to the library. And in the summer, it is late enough that they've already finished some of the other programs they might have going on during the summer. Um, similarly, you might want to consider just how much time you want to go with your sessions. We go for an hour, so we end at five. Um, this lets us get in either one big project or a few minor projects. One important thing to consider, though, is to make sure you allot enough time for children to be doing these projects. Mm -hmm. I know when I test a project, I tend to allot double that time because mm -hmm. working with a small group of children is going to take more as you help them and work them through the process. Um, one of our examples, we did a thing where we were dyeing eggs. We were showing different ways to dye eggs and how that worked. Um, dyeing eggs with a kit, it seems like it won't take a lot of time. You've done it all your life, but when you have a lot of children working through and dyeing all those eggs, um, it really took up a lot of our time and we ended up not getting to spend as much time on the unconventional methods we had planned. Yeah, we've experimented with a variety of durations for our programs, anywhere from 45 minute sessions to two hours. Um, and it does depend kind of on the project that you want to tackle, but I agree that generally about an hour is a good time period for most projects. And sometimes you can carry over a project from one session to another if you um, need to. Definitely. Um, next, you want to know your budget and plan appropriately. Um, I know there have been so many ideas through Maker Camp and just elsewhere that they are so cool, but it would be so costly for a library to implement. Mm -hmm. um, they had this really cool pachinko machine, I remember, last year, and it was just all the bells and whistles, but that was very expensive for a bunch of children to do. So if you have a good understanding of what basic supplies are on hand at your location, you can work from there to estimate how much more you're going to need per project per camper. Um, we try to aim for projects less than $4 for, per camper. We usually do go under that, but if you find that you're able to plan a project that goes way under that, you may want to have a more extravagant project the next week. Right. Yeah, even $4 a camper can be a lot for some libraries, and so even if you have a completely non-existent budget, it's still possible to have a maker program at your library, so don't get discouraged. <laughs> a lot of the programs can be um, made with materials that are often just thrown away or recycled, so ask your oh, yeah. patrons to gather them for you. And um, Also, if you do apply and get accepted as an affiliate with the official summer Summer Maker Camp at makercamp.com. Um, they often send a free box of useful materials to those libraries who are affiliates, um, and it's got great things in yes. it. Everything from um, LEDs and batteries to um, uh, little bits and Arduinos and Makey Makeys, um, t shirts for all the campers, pencils, stickers, postcards, yeah. lots of different materials that are really helpful. So in that case, would, are you able to tell them how many kids you think you're going to have so that, that is, they know how much to send to each library? It is part of the application okay. process to tell them about how many you expect to get. But I think they have just kind of a standard amount that they get because we said, you know, we might get 20 to 30 kids for a big summer event, um, and we got 10 T-shirts. So, <laughs> but they also yeah. send a, a nice little plastic um, stencil oh, that we yes. could use to make our own. Own shirts oh, for nice. multiple okay. um, kids. Yep. So I yeah, the maker thing. Exactly, it's one of the projects. Make your own T-shirt. <laughs> exactly. And yeah. if I remember correctly, those supplies sort of went with their programming for that session. So yes. it really helped to find some of the more obscure, expensive items that you may need. Exactly. Um, along those lines, um, there are lots of things I know I. I'm not a professional in, I couldn't, or I wouldn't be willing to teach children how to do this. So please reach out to your community and use their, those members as instructors. Um, 
we made these little pins using soldering with LEDs and stuff. And we at the library didn't know how to solder. So we brought in leaders from our local Boy Scout group to help get those soldered and work together in a safe environment. And we've also partnered with professors from our local university to help bring in some new skills um, and offer programs that go beyond the expertise of just our staff members in the library. So it is good to look outside of the box. There. Yeah, I know we are looking at doing some sort of like sewing, knitting, crocheting stuff, and we have guilds and groups in the community that will definitely help with that yeah, coming that's up this perfect. year. Um, so the next part of the planning is to think about what types of projects you'll do. Um, at our library, we work from a pretty broad definition of what constitutes a maker. Um, and so that means that we also have a variety, um, a wide variety of types of projects that we can choose from. We don't limit ourselves to doing projects that only incorporate technology or engineering, although many of them do. Um, but in my opinion, a craft-based project is great. Um, um, especially when it's maybe just one part of several weeks of making. Really, it's just all hands-on opportunities are important to build that skill set for makers. Um, one of the things that I like to refer to is this handout that I found um, from the Michigan Makers. And we're going to take a look at a screenshot of what this handout is. Um, but you can get it from that link. And like Krista said, um, all this presentation mm -hmm. and the links will be available afterwards. Yeah. Um, if you can't read it now, don't worry. That's Go right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this handout um, was great for me. Um, it, uh, like I said, it came from the Michigan makers and um, it was just what's uh, what do you think you would want in your school? Um, you could substitute library, um, but your school or library's dream makerspace. And just seeing all the different things that they listed um, made me kind of think outside the box. Like it doesn't all have to be um, programming or circuitry or robotics, but like they have all kinds of um, uh, textile based things, stitching. They even have cooking, paper crafts, gardening, um, video production. So really, incorporating all of that into making um, and thinking of what types of programs could we do from each of those categories. So as you can see, um, the Maker Camp um, doesn't have to involve just robotics or an Arduino or a complex circuitry. Um, <laughs> you can do something with knitting or origami or cooking or gardening. So um, once you have an idea of what the types of projects you might want to do, then it's a matter of finding the ideas. That's what I like about people who are getting more outside of the whole just making maker spaces of technology mm -hmm. and getting into all those other non techy things. And it really makes you think, you know, so many people are saying, oh, I've got to do something new at the library again. And at maker spaces and making camps are all the new big thing. i got to figure out something brand new to learn. No, you've been doing this stuff. <laughs> exactly. You've done craft events. You've done. You've had someone come in and teach everyone how to knit or whatever. Exactly. It's the Definitely. same thing. They're just calling it something different now. That's exactly. all it is. Don't <laughs> you panic. don't need to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. <laughs> Rebrand. Do the same stuff you've been doing. Rebrand it as a makerspace, and pff, you'll double your exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, as for ways to structure your maker camp sessions, one of the ways I've done is I've planned a theme session. Um, so I pick a central theme and then maybe do one big project or several small projects around that theme. Um, for example, when we did our sessions in March, one of them fell on St. Patrick's Day. So what we had done was we did projects that centered around green or gold ideas. So um, for the green side of things, we had them make clover crystals with pipe cleaners and borax solution, which was very interesting. Um, and then as we transferred over to gold, we had gold foil chocolate coins, and we weighed one, and we saw we asked them, how much do you think this would cost if it were a real gold chocolate coin, or gold oh, wow. coin? And once we had them guess, we sort of explained why gold is so expensive, why it's such a commodity to us. And we also um, made the structures of both real gold, real gold and fool's gold um, using marshmallows and toothpicks. They have very different structures. Um, fool's gold is much more complex, so it was very interesting to see them try to work it all together. So. <laughs> um, additionally, what you can do is sort of present a challenge to your campers and then have them work from there. Um, I define a challenge as you sort of give them a goal and some materials and then have them work from there to reach that goal. 
Um, one of the examples I have is the egg drop challenge where mm -hmm. we gave them each an egg and then they had a variety of materials from which they could pick only a few and then they had to create a structure around that egg that would secure it from breaking after being dropped from a large height. Um, another example is marshmallow and toothpick structures, um, building the tallest tower. We had a session recently where we gave them all sorts of goals as well as restrictions that they had to work around. That reminds me, um, when I was younger, we had a thing in school called Odyssey of the Mind, and they would do these spontaneous challenges, and it was really similar to that, you know, you'd yeah. get like 20 pieces of spaghetti and a few rubber bands and this thing around with tape, and then be like, you've got five minutes to make this cantilever structure, <laughs> but that's a great way to kind of get their yeah. you know, creative juices flowing, and I like that idea. Yeah. All right, so the next um, slide just has lots and lots of resources that you can turn to for um, project ideas. Um, just in addition to Maker Camp's resources, um, right now Maker Camp has released their sort of summer session, which I believe is five weeks of four projects each of varying um, difficulties and material requirements, but there's a lot of great ideas in there. In addition, they also have all their um, previous sessions, the instruction for those, they do have those available as well. But if you find yourself running out of ideas there or just want to look elsewhere, um, you can look anywhere on the internet, essentially. Um, YouTube has lots of great DIY videos, Instructables, um, WikiHow, eHow. Um, if you see a project on Facebook, like someone shares one of those videos or you just happen to see something, it's become sort of a habit of thought to sort of think, how can I incorporate that into our maker camp sessions? Um, so in addition to all those great resources that Joe just mentioned, um, I've also had luck uh, at makezine.com. They've got a great um, selection of projects. Uh, the Make It At Your Library website mm -hmm. is excellent. And I like that one because it's um, it's got places where you can narrow it down by how much time do you have? Wow. What age are you working with? Um, you know, what's your budget? And so then you can uh, narrow down your project search by those criteria. Um, and so then is there's some place where other other people have already figured out like how long it should take. So right, so if you're, you're talking about you know trying to figure out how long will these little yes. kids going to take yeah. to do something that you can do in you know half the time. Exactly. That's good that someone's already figured out it's going to take if you've got you know ten little kids. It's really going to be this long, not what you think. It's yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's nice that someone has to figure that all out for you and yeah. you have to guess and hopefully get it right. Right. <laughs> Um, so lots of the websites that are listed there, as well as some great books um, that I've been able to get project ideas from. So uh, this list will be available in the archived um, presentation. So. Once you know what you're doing, it's time to gather some materials. Yep, and as we said, their libraries have different budgets or constraints. So to help with that, um, my first tip is to seek donations from local businesses whenever possible. Um, in our experience, we found that businesses are happy to donate supplies, especially if it's specific to their business. Yeah. Um, for example, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Free for them. Um, two of the examples I have was we were going to make pizza box ovens as part of Maker Camp's sessions last summer. So we asked our local Pizza Hut if they would donate pizza boxes, and they gave us these personal pan pizza boxes, which were smaller than the boxes that the initial mm -hmm. instructions required. But we found that they made for much more smaller projects that really worked well. Um, if we have time, I'll show mine later. I did bring one along. Um, in addition to that, we had a local dentistry donate the toothbrushes we need for brush bots or bristle bots. Um, so that was really great. Yeah, and don't forget about asking your patrons to collect things as well. Um, when our library made stomp rockets, um, we reached out to them to um, bring us all their old milk jugs that we could use for those. Um, and we also got a local bicycle shop to donate old bicycle inner tubes for that project. So um, all of these kinds of things can make for great small partnerships between the library and the community. Oh, but don't forget to send a oh, thank yeah. you. Oh, yeah, don't forget to send a thank you. <laughs> and it's great if you have, like, that project going on and you have the thank you card right there so they can all sign it and you can oh, see it. Oh, have all the kids sign it. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, as for the more obscure or um, stuff you can't find in town or from donations, you can always check online. I know 
the impetus is always to shop local, but there are some things you just may not be able to find in Geneva, especially. Um, we did edible water bottles, and that uses some gastronomic um, chemicals that mm -hmm. probably we weren't going to be able to find locally, but Amazon, you just search them, and they were right there for a very reasonable price, so um, they were easily available, so yeah. always check there. And Makershed.com is a Maker great Shed place too. as well for some of the more technical things yeah. that you might need for projects. Yeah, I just looked on their site right now. They're actually having a back-to-school sale. Ooh, hey, um, good tip. <laughs> yeah, um, for all books are 50% off. Oh, yeah. Yeah, if mm -hmm. you have books, offer ends August 31st. Jump on. Okay, there you go. <laughs> um, but, and then we have a list of just some of the most um, often, often used materials that we've experienced um, in our uh, maker camps. So you can see that there. You know, things that aren't really that expensive. Yeah. Pipe cleaners, mm -hmm. straws. <laughs> Um, masking tape, um, cardboard, but there are a few things. We use, at least our library, we use LEDs, those light emitting mm -hmm. diodes, a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were able to get some for free th um, as being an affiliate with Maker Camp, yep. but you can buy big packs of them oh, yeah. on Amazon and they've yeah. lasted us a long time. And same with the coin cell batteries. Some of the, um Things like little bits and those, don't they, because I know we've had people on the show in, in the past years, but mm -hmm. do sometimes do free free supplies to libraries or schools? Sometimes, some sort of yeah, if you or, can catch it. Okay, yeah. yeah, you just have to pay, you know, to keep an eye on them when they're offering it. Yeah, okay. exactly, yeah. So um, lots of free or cheap materials that you can get a hold of. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, moving on to sort of promoting your maker camp. Um, it's a lot of the same things you would do for other library events. Um, we post signs for every session. I try to make a sign colorful that will attract people's attention. I post one by the front door, as well as put one in the teen section so they can see it where they're hanging out in the library. Um, you also want to get these in local businesses if you can on their bulletin boards. Um, another venue is social media. We try to put events and posts on our Facebook and Google Plus page. And then um, one thing we've noticed recently, actually, is that if you make an event, it tends to like hide behind all the other stuff if you make it well in advance. So you may want to bring that event up again as you get closer to the actual session so that people can see it again. Um, a simple one is just word of mouth. Um, I find that when... Um, campers come into the library, I'll just ask them, hey, are you coming to Maker Camp this week? And then I might, maybe I'll give them the whole project, but sometimes I'll just give them clues, like, hey, we're going to be working with balloons, like the stuff that's really going to grab their attention. Like if you say you're working with some sort of food stuff, they're always going to, their ears are going <laughs> to perk up, or just anything that really gets their minds thinking as to what it could be. And then the final one is, um, going into local groups and getting your Maker Camp sessions out there. Um, going into the fall semester, now is a great time for you to get your word into the schools. Um, you can hang up one of your sites on their bulletin boards or even just incorporate it into their daily announcements. I know having that set over the intercoms every day is mm -hmm. certainly going to get it ingrained into their mind. Um, it's also good to just uh, reach out to local groups like 4-H clubs, Boys Scouts, Girl Scouts, because the children who are already involved in programs like those mm -hmm. are often interested in maker programs. Definitely. Um, and so letting the leaders of those um, local clubs know what's being offered at the library can bring in those additional participants. And it's also a good connection to make because those leaders could be potential guest instructors um, for right, maker those programs. Right, organizations are already doing craft type things yes. or creative type yeah mm -hmm. right for their for their kids and then once the day comes upon you, it's time to run and supervise Maker Camp. Um, my first tip is that the more supervision, the better. Um, <laughs> we found that instructing like a dozen or so campers through a project with one or even two staff can be quite a difficult job as you try to get to each camper and help them with their specific problems. So if you can get adult or teen volunteers to help lighten the load, they can either help campers through some of the steps or just prepare for steps in the future of that project. So that'll help keep things running smoothly and moving along. Um, another thing you want to do is let the campers work at their own pace with some boundaries. Um, 
we often work with a wide range of ages, so some people are going to be able to pick up concepts easier, while others are going to get stuck. So I always try to just help them with that one step and then let them continue. Um, if they're really having some trouble, you can sort of do it for them, but I really want to leave that as a last resort. Um, you really want them to do it so they're having the fun and you're having the fun watching them. Um, on the other hand, you can have some children who, once they see all the pieces in front of them and their minds get to working and they just think, oh, I can do this all. So they just <laughs> rush and do it, which sometimes it works, but then they're left ahead and they're waiting for whatever step they're now stuck on when we're not there yet. Or it can just be that they just don't follow the instructions <laughs> correctly and then they use some materials improperly and then Sometimes they're stuck. it works out, but not always. Sometimes <laughs> it works out. Um, what I try to do is I give the campers materials as they're needed so that they're not presented with all these options and they can work on the one step that everyone is working mm -hmm. on before they get the materials for the next one step. Bit, one step at a time. So, yeah, and you can even as you're handing it out be like, how are we going to use this next piece in the project? And yeah, for those kids who really rush through and get done, and then they're left bored and mm -hmm. or you know causing trouble then afterwards, I find that if I suggest maybe some customizations that they could do now or some mm -hmm. modifications, like what if you changed this part and tried it, what would it do now? Um, that that can help direct their energy in a positive way, <laughs> um, or they might even be willing to help someone in class who needs a True. little bit more mm -hmm. assistance. And That's so. what I was wondering. Are they good at you know becoming teachers themselves? Right. Yeah. yeah. So trying friends. those things. Yeah. It's good to give them a, a good outlet for that. Yeah. If your project has a take-home element, you can always have some like art supplies mm -hmm. out so they can sort of decorate <laughs> it and customize it to their liking. Yeah. Exactly. Um, Finally, I always try to put a little bit of science or methodology into the project at hand. Um, like Megan said, not every project has to be super technological, but if you can still just throw a little facts in here or there. Um, we are working with aluminum foil, and I tried to tell them um, what the melting point of aluminum foil was, or why we switched from tin foil to aluminum foil. Um, it's not going to stick for every child, of course, but some campers will hold on to those facts and have some sort of interesting tidbit to share. Yeah. They'll go home and tell their parents, and the parents are like, what did you learn? <laughs> Where did you figure this out? <laughs> That's right. So the next thing that we'd like to do is just go through some of our favorite projects. So that'll give you an idea of the types of things that you can do in Maker Camp and just some helpful hints and tips. Um, so that's just want to remind everyone, if you do have any questions, um, type them in. Um, we can grab the questions anytime you want. We don't have to wait till the end or right. anything. So if you have any questions about how to set up your Maker Camp or anything they've mentioned already, um, go ahead and type it in. I'm monitoring that here on my laptop, and um, we can get your questions answered. Or if you've done something like this yourself, I'm not sure if you know of any others places in Nebraska have done. I know a lot of people have Maker Spaces and things. Yeah, um, I think a lot probably are doing it. Yeah, or something maybe. similar. Just yeah, I don't know. Yeah. And and I should just mention, too, now that you had said setting up your, your maker camp, um, I think both Geneva and I don't have a dedicated maker space uh, no. in our library. That's what I was wondering, like the difference um, between, because, I mean, the main term you hear is maker space, maker space, right. and a lot, of, and we've had people on the show about that, mm -hmm. how, you know, if you've got this room set off in an area, you can put all this stuff, um, and some places do have that and some don't. So, right. um Maker Camp would be an option then for places that do not, have, there's nowhere we can yes. have this. Because you're talking about, you know, it's a certain time, time of yes. week, each yep. week at a certain time, rather than just an open room where it's always available. Right. Yeah. yeah. So this is more, yeah. you know, you can have your materials, you can haul them into a meeting room yeah. and set it up for just, just that particular time. Particular yeah. time. Right. yeah. So. All right. Okay. So the first project I brought up is um, geodesic domes. We made them with straws and pipe cleaners. Um, I think the final result of this project was very neat. We made just domes. You can make the full sphere, but we did find that this project was one of our most lengthy ones. It did take two mm -hmm. weeks. Um, we did have the children cut the straws. They had to be cut to very specific dimensions, which ends up taking a lot of time. And of course, if you can see on the screen, making all those little shapes and then hooking them all together mm -hmm. can take a bit of time. It looks like there's, oh, is that a completed one back there? Oh yeah, on there the is a completed one back there. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I really like this project. Um, 
In the future, I'd like to almost do one where it's just sort of a free build with these straws mm -hmm. and pipe cleaners, see what they can create because... What can you come up with? Yeah. yeah. Um, one of our favorite projects um, were draw bots and bristle bots. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> um, so the draw bots, uh, they just, uh, they're pretty simple really. It takes a vibrating motor, just a small little vibrating source. Um, we were able to get um, these little vibrating motors from a local electronics store that was able to salvage them out of mm -hmm. old cell phones oh, yeah. for oh, us. We've also been able to get them out of like vibrating razors or toothbrushes. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are a couple different sources for you to find those. But you can also. You're also teaching recycling. Yes, I know. <laughs> yeah. Although you can just buy the vibrating motors, you know, from <laughs> Radio Shack or Amazon as well. Mm -hmm. But all you need is a vibrating motor and then a power source, which we just use the little coin cell batteries. Mm -hmm. um, and then you attach that to the top of. Of a plastic or paper cup and you tape three markers on the inside or outside of that cup and then let that thing just vibrate away and I've got a little video here oh, that yeah. hopefully you can <laughs> see it in action and oh, put wow. down some paper and let it go and um, we were able to experiment with moving the motor to different parts of the cup and see if it would make it kind of mm -hmm. um, turn in circles. We've also I see some of it looks like their circles were done. Yes, yeah, yeah. and then uh, not only changing the location of the motor, but then adjusting how far the each marker oh. um, sticks out. So mm -hmm. if you make one marker leg stick out a little bit longer than the others, that can make it go in different directions. And mm -hmm. so that was a lot of fun. Um, they it's like a home, making a homemade spirograph. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I know in the current programming for Maker Camp, they have a variation of this using straw views, which are like little connectors you can use with straws to put them yeah. together and make this shape. So. Yeah, so you don't have to use a cup either. You can mm -hmm. think of other ways. Um, and then this bottom one here, these are bristle bots, and those are made with you cut off the um, bristle end of a toothbrush and then you tape the vibrating motor and the battery onto the top of that um, toothbrush. Now the one trick is the bristles on the toothbrush have to be the kind that are going at a diagonal. They can't be just the straight up and down bristles otherwise mm -hmm. it won't really move very well. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also taped like some wings and different things onto <laughs> some of these to make Get them look cool. Yeah. Uh, this one the volume might be a little loud the the kids were really into this. So. <laughs> oh, that one it flipped over, but we're gonna write it and then let it go crazy again. <laughs> so yeah, that little those things they really go, and we were able to put it into. You can see it's going over the top of where we let our mm -hmm. our draw bot go, but um, we had to either put it in a box or tape up some edges, yeah. otherwise oh, yeah. it would just, just fall off the off. table. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we, we first thought that we could race them, but they don't oh, go yeah. in straight, straight lines. So. Yeah, Racing when we did. Them, you have to put a little lane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When we did ours, we also made an arena, and it's just fun to have all the children sort of hovering over and watching theirs and also watching others and seeing how they, the anomalies and the others. Yeah. And I like around. the idea of calling it a re an arena. Yeah. It's yeah. like battle bots. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they can all have a mini battle bots. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, I have mentioned this one earlier when we were talking about challenges. This was from our egg drop challenge. Um, we, they were allowed to purchase, like purchase with air quotes, um, six materials from a list we gave them. It was just basically we sort of raided our supply closet and saw whatever sort of materials we could use for this project. Um, cardboard tubes, balloons you see, pipe cleaners, saran wrap, aluminum foil, all those things. Um, and then they had time to build. We had some restrictions that they had to show a quarter's worth of the egg in their final project. Mm -hmm. The egg had to be able to be recovered so that we could check if it was still intact. Um, I know in other groups that have done this have banned parachutes, and we didn't know how that would work. So we didn't ban them here, but a lot of children did use parachutes, and they did seem to work. So it's something to mm -hmm. consider. I think they still had to come up with the idea of a parachute, so how that do you was build fine. Them to make it work, yeah. 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 
Um, so yeah, once everyone built their project, we stepped out. There's a tile area, very important when you're working with eggs to have <laughs> an easily cleanable surface. Um, we still laid down a drop cloth and we, I just got up on a step ladder and I dropped them from a high surface and we saw what survived and what didn't. I was just going to ask how, what height, so you were on a ladder. Yeah, okay. about, I would say about 10 feet. You didn't like climb up to the roof oh, of the building no. or anything? I mean, that would be great, but. Sure. <laughs> and I will oh, say that, right. um, Next, or actually tomorrow, we are doing sort of the inverse of this for our maker camp where they will just drop an egg from the tall height and they sort of have to make the cradle at That's the bottom that will support catcher. that and oh. absorb all that weight and not break the egg. Oh, so nice. we'll see how that goes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, we did stomp rockets, which is pretty great. Um, it just takes a large milk jug, um, a piece of bicycle inner tube, some duct tape to duct tape that on there, um, a little small chunk of PVC pipe, which was really the, the only semi-expensive part of this that we weren't able to um, just get from donations, and also a little bit of um, well, we did two different types of rockets. One we made out of foam, and it was just like the foam insulation that you put around pipes. You could also probably use um, pool noodles, although they'd be a little bit thick. <laughs> um, the thinner ones were better. Um, and we also made uh, paper rockets as well. Um, these were really fun for the kids um, because rockets, first of all, <laughs> you know, you hear the word rocket, I yeah. want to go to that. Um, and also it just, it worked. It was so successful um, and they worked really well. Um, I would recommend that if you have the ability to go someplace outside of the library yeah. after oh, they're constructed yeah. to test them out, that would be great. Yeah, um, some that are very, very successfully yes, built. Yeah. Not that. <laughs> um, what we did uh, for our test run though is you can kind of see a whiteboard in the back of the photo mm -hmm. there. We were able to draw a target on the whiteboard and stand across mm -hmm. the room and aim them that way yeah. instead of straight up um, and that worked pretty well um, uh, yeah they these were so successful um, the paper ones actually fly farther than the foam ones um, I tested this out um, afterwards <laughs> at my house with one and it flew and got stuck on the neighbor's two-story roof <laughs> but they, they do fly and they're pretty neat so um, that was a very successful program and uh, with mostly donated materials. Okay, the next one I sort of build as technological dissection. So the whole week before I was telling them, oh, we're going to be doing a dissection, so be prepared. <laughs> so they were excited to dissect like animals or something. So, but this was also very successful. What we had done was we had gathered all sorts of donated um, old or obsolete keyboards or um, cell phones. I think we had a phone, just any sort of old electronic that just wasn't working or just wasn't able to be used anymore. And we just sort of had them take screwdrivers and players' safety glasses, of course. And even with that, we still, I think, had a first aid kit on hand just in case they had any sharp edges. But what we had them do was just have at it and see how far they could crack into these devices, <laughs> um, see what sort of things they could find inside as to how those items worked. Um, the one thing you do want to make sure you're not getting any electronics with um, we didn't have any microwaves. We tried to stay away from batteries. We did have some cell phones, but we did take the batteries out, so those weren't in there. Um, just make sure all your electronics are somewhat safe for them to crack into. This one I would think you'd have to know, because they're going to ask, once they get those things open, what do all the different parts <laughs> do? So you would have to either know yourself or have done some research on what's inside one of these yourself because other I personally well, off the top of my head I wouldn't know what's, oh, true. Yeah. what's inside like, a keyboard what once I get open. <laughs> yeah. And I'm also looking at that thinking, okay, once they've taken all the keys off the keyboard and gotten to the innards can we save all those pieces and use them for another, oh, yeah. you know, make jewelry <laughs> out of them or do some other kind of project. <laughs> 
Um, another program that was kind of neat, and it didn't have a take-home element, so they weren't able to bring home a final project with them, but it was still probably the biggest hit of last summer um, with our middle school age kids, was building a Rube Goldberg machine. Uh, most of the kids had not heard of Rube Goldberg, um, but uh, after I showed them a few videos of like these elaborate chain reactions, um, uh, there was one that Mythbusters did, that was pretty great. Um, there's lots of, of videos that you can find of these amazing Rube Goldberg machines that where basically you're um, going through a very complicated set of chain reactions to get to something simple at the end, like opening a bottle or you know just something <laughs> um, like that. Um, but once they got the idea of it, they just loved it and they went for it. And it was really easy to do because we just gathered a lot of materials, toy cars, dominoes, Jenga blocks, balls of different sizes, cardboard tubes, um, uh, yarn, uh, craft sticks, uh, books to, to make things on different levels. Um, and it was pretty neat. They kind of divided themselves into two or three groups and worked together to build different sections of the Rube Goldberg machine. And then after they had built their section, then they had to try to figure out how to join it to the other groups to continue the chain reaction. Um, and then at the end, we video videotaped uh, how it went. There were a couple of flaws and we had to start <laughs> over and try our own and are, Yes, it doesn't always work the first time, but that was a, a really neat program that got them thinking creatively. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea. We haven't done that at the Geneva Library, so I may have to steal there that one. There you go. <laughs> um, my last one that I'll be showing is edible water bottles. And this one is one of the notable ones to me because I sort of looked at this idea of like these edible water bottles I was just like, is this something I could ever do at the library? And it turned out it was fairly simple and it was a great project. Um, what it is, is you make two baths of water and then a chemical. One is sodium alginate and then the other is calcium lactate. So you take the first and put it into the second and it sort of gels up and creates this membrane around a pocket of water. And then you fish them out and if you eat them, there's still some liquid water inside. Hmm. So it was very interesting. Um, I think we had two groups working on this and once they got them, we each had them try one and uh, their opinions on the final project were a little mixed because there is sort of a weird taste due to the <laughs> chemicals. The flavor is um, there it's sort of like one? just a very chemical-y taste. <laughs> totally safe, but I, we asked them, is this the future of water bottles? And they were like, probably not. <laughs> But, I wonder if you yeah. could add flavor. Yeah. yeah. Well, what we, flavor, what we did do, we did have a little bit of time for this one, was we had brought down some food coloring, and we dyed the actual bath, so that made it a little more of a contrast in the um, calcium lactate bath. So that was interesting. Yeah, cool. Um, and the last one that I'm going to talk about in detail are um, 3D printed zipper pulls. Um, so if you have access to a 3D printer, um, either at your library or maybe a local school or a local university has one that they'll um, let you use, it's wonder to, wonderful to be able to offer some programs that introduce kids to 3D printing software. Um, the one that we like to use at our library is Tinkercad. Um, it's great because it's free. It's on Online. It doesn't require anything to be downloaded to your computers, um, and it's pretty intuitive and easy yep. for the kids to catch onto. And there are some to. beginner tutorials that you can lead them through. Yes, yes. So they can design their own that. Yes. Not right. taken into then created by someone else. Yes. That's nice. Yeah, they're not just going out to, <laughs> you know, Thingiverse and <laughs> grabbing something and say, print this for me. And they're and making if, their own thing. If they do say, oh, I want this, you can sort of be like, okay, how can you use that using the resources of Tinkercad? Like, how can you combine these shapes to make this new shape that you want? Right. Mm -hmm. um, so we like to start out with just small, kind of relatively simple things for them to design and print, like keychains or zipper pulls. It's a good way to get their feet wet, and it's not so much um, in 3D that they, you know, get overwhelmed with working mm -hmm. in that 3D environment. Um, it's kind of a nice middle ground because they're just taking more or less something flat and then adding a 3D element mm -hmm. to it. Um, I think also something like that because it's not fast 3D printing. Right. It would take less time to 
print to have print printed. Print so exactly. they can yeah. Yes. And so what I like to do in our 3D printing programs is just kind of start out by explaining a little bit about how a 3D printer works. Many of them have never seen one before or don't really understand the process. So I explain about it, let it let them see it in action, um, and then show them Tinkercad and the different tools and then give them time at the end to design and work on their um, their project. And then at the end of the session, we put all the um, designs usually download onto a flash drive, and then they don't get to leave with anything that day because, like Krista said, it's a lengthy process to print. Um, and so we just print them as we have time then throughout the week and then call them when it's done for them to come in and pick it up. Mm -hmm. um, so. All right. Um, the last thing that we want to show you is that um, Joseph and I have taken um, all of our project ideas that we've used in the last few years in our different maker camps and put them together in our little collaborative um, Google Sheet here, which I'm hoping will open up. And if I just make this full screen, you can kind of see that. Um, and there are over 50 project ideas on here. And we've got it arranged so that you can see what grades we offered that program for, how long our session was, what the project was, um, links to the different resources where you might find instructions for the project or a tutorial, um, a listing of the different supplies it takes, comments, which I think are probably the most <laughs> important, <laughs> um, to just kind of say, this worked well, this didn't. And then which one of us um, did that program so that if you do have any questions about it, you can contact us. And so, like I said, there's over 50 projects on here, everything from some of the 3D things, soldering, balloon-powered cars, um, brush bots, which we've talked about, um, a catapult basketball game. Yeah. That sounds interesting. I think, I think <laughs> I'll have to look at that one. That. <laughs> Um, let's see here. Crayon wallet. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Um, let's see here. Um, like I said, it can be more craft based. Yeah, the finger knitting and arm knitting. Um, uh, we also did kind of a variation of those brush bots where we called them glider bots and we put them in those, um, they're called like acorn capsules. They're like those things that in vending machines for kids oh, that like a little yeah. toy might come mm -hmm. in um, where you mount the vibrating motor and stuff in one of those and they just slide all over <laughs> the place and dance around the table. Um, uh, we did one where we worked with a green screen um, and uh, let the kids kind of make their own uh, movie video and put, then go on the computer and put in a different background. So some of them are in the <laughs> flying on magic carpets and different things like that. Um, so lots of different yeah. um, program ideas in here to get you started because um, you know, you don't have to start from <laughs> page one all the time. You can look at something like this where there's lots of ideas gathered in one spot and not have to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. And we hope as more maker camps and maker spaces emerge that we can get more people contributing to this with their ideas so that yeah. we can continue to collaborate. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think there's, there's 57 ideas mm -hmm. on there right now. Um, so I don't know if, how we're doing on time, if we can show a couple of things that we brought with us or if that's sure, about yeah. it. Sure, no, yeah, we can. Um, yeah, I was just thinking as you're going through this, showing this list here that it gave me the idea that a lot of these things could potentially um, be used because these maker camps, I mean, you guys usually do them in the summer as kind of like summer camp, or do you also do them during? We also do them during the year, year. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, anytime. yeah, like after school type programs. Mm -hmm. Okay, because yeah. I was thinking they could also be connected to summer reading program Definitely. in libraries, yeah. um, depending on what the topic is. And you got to get creative sometime. But, mm -hmm. and this year's is just wrapping up, is over. But next year's topic is, is, is oh, um, great. It's build a better word world <laughs> is the slogan. It's one slogan for all levels this time, build a better world. And the general topic is building, construction, architecture, com but then in, so making things, <laughs> but then also community building, volunteering, so building a better world that way. But all of those kind of physical creative things, any of this would totally go with that. I think yeah, the library right. should say, 
summer reading program maker camp. <laughs> I agree. I think that I, would that be one great. Kind of <laughs> matches up. The next year, 2018, it's music, and the um, and then the year after that is space, which definitely. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah. a lot of cool things for both of those. I know Maker yeah, Camp has right. done. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I know we did like a, a makey makey piano um, with bananas yeah. um, and different types of musical instruments, making rain sticks and different oh, things. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you want to show some of the stuff, we can definitely do that. Um, let's we'll adjust the camera here okay. so people can okay. see a little mm -hmm. better. We're gonna do a little adjusting here for you guys so we can uh, I'm gonna move this up. Let's see here. And maybe even stretch it out a little bit. Trying to make it a little larger. There we go. We're improvising here. <laughs> a little bit. Alright. <laughs> and then I hold over here. Let's see, what do you got? There's a whole bunch of stuff here on the table you brought along for us. Um, one of the things that we did last summer, like you said, to kind of go along with the summer theme, uh, that was the superheroes and right. things last mm -hmm. summer, um, we did these power cuffs, like you know, a oh. superhero might wear. This one's too small, so I can't actually wear it, but um, it's a light up LED um, bracelet made with duct tape and, and such. So, and that one's. And that's kind of right fun. now, there's all those different colors of duct tape you can oh, get. Of course. Oh, of yeah. Florida, you can get really creative. Right, yeah. right. Um, and like I said, we use LEDs a lot. Another one that was kind of fun um, that I just did this summer were these light up LED um, bow ties. They could also be hair ties. Uh, you can kind of see it's a flashing LED even, <laughs> which I'm like, oh, it's flashing, it's changing color. <laughs> so that's pretty great. Want to show one of you? Um, this one is sort of the cardboard pachinko machine that they. Um, sort of Maker Camp came up with this. They sort of used it as a precursor to that bigger electronic pachinko machine I was talking about earlier. But this one's really simple. It's just cardboard. We hot glued it together to create this frame. Um, if you can see here, there's little slots for the different point totals. And then we did two layers so that the thumbtacks here would not puncture through on the back. But we just drew out a grid and put thumbtacks all along in the proper places. So. You can slide a marble down through there, create your own point system. Worked out as a pretty great project. What we actually did was we put behind the thumbtacks, we had them take a piece of cardstock and create their own design to give it a little more color and personality. Um, last year in December, we did these soft snowmen. Um, they are, like Megan was saying, they are more of a craft project, but that's okay. They had a ton of fun doing these. Lots of little opportunities to personalize. Um, the little scrap of cloth here that's being used as a scarf, we actually had one of our cold groups donate all their little nice. bits and scraps oh. of fabric that they didn't have a use for, but they worked really well for scarves. And then inside of these, I should say, is rice. So mm -hmm. we just ended up getting a bulk bag of rice and just filling it up. Um, one of the things that I've got planned for this year's after school programs, we haven't actually done these yet um, with the group, but they're slingshot rockets and really simple and cheap. Uh, a straw, a little bit of cardstock, some masking tape, and a paper clip, and then a craft stick with a rubber band. And it's just a matter of hooking that little, um, I get it the right way. <laughs> Let's see here, it's getting, hooking that on there and just slingshotting the rocket. I'm not coordinated enough to, <laughs> to get it together right now. But um, And then one that we did this summer was a wire loop game, like you would see at, um, oh, at the no. carnival. Um, now, it'd be nice if I could have afforded some um, buzzers to oh, really yeah. make this <laughs> stand out. But we just hooked up LED lights. And I think as I transport it here today, it kind of came <laughs> apart. But it's one of those where if you touch the wire loop as you're going, um, the LED will light up. 
sort of like the game of operation too. Mm -hmm. so, um, and if you use like, we also have some really big LEDs that are nice and bright that I had the kids use and that really um, brought their attention to, uh oh, I, I touched the wire loop. And we had them if they wanted to decorate or make their um, cardboard base more elaborate. And some of them really did crazy things with their wire too, making it extra <laughs> challenging. So, um, that's kind of a fun little project. Um, another sort of game one I have here is this cat basketball catapult game we created. This was ended up being one of our more expensive ones. We did try to get the wood donated, but we couldn't get any, so the wood was one of our most expensive components. So definitely, if you do want to do this one, do reach out to your local lumberyards or hardware stores to see if you can get that wood. But um, it's just wood blocks, and then we have duct tape a spoon to this wood block. And you can adjust these different blocks to get different arcs and stuff. Um, this post here is just made from a dowel and some cardboard and this cardstock box here. And so you can use any small thing. I think we had pom-poms, marshmallows, spice drops on hand, and you just sort of put it in there and flick and hope it gets in the bucket. <laughs> it was a very fun project and nice to take home. Um, Oh, yeah, I did bring a bristle box. Um, I like the wings. Yeah, and for this one, the wires are on the wings, so that makes it very nice to manage. Hopefully, I can get to stick. Oh, it got a little finicky with the wires. But, oh, there we go. Uh, let's move it all around there. <laughs> cool. Unplug that so we don't waste the battery. And then last one I have is the pizza boxes. This was one of our first projects that we did. Um, it was one of Maker Camps in that first session that we did. Um, it's just a personal pan pizza box. We cut out a square here and covered it with saran wrap. You try to get it as flat as possible, but I think over time it has wrinkled up a bit. And then on the bottom, you line that with tin foil to help reflect, and you put down a black surface to soak up that heat. Um, this flap here is also lined with tin foil, and we've just attached a straw to help prop it up. And so when we made these on the day, we were fortunate enough that it was sunny mm -hmm. and warm. But I think a really easy thing you could use with this to ensure a success is chocolate bars for s'mores, because they're always going to melt in the heat. Yeah. So you've got a success right there, and it was a great mm -hmm. project. Um, and then I just have a couple little things to finish up with. Um, we have also done more than one program with old t-shirts. Mm -hmm. uh, you may recognize this from a summer past, Dragon yeah. Dreams and Daring Days. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember what year that was, but <laughs> um, but we made t-shirt backpacks, um, and they've got a little, uh, and the oh. strings themselves are made out of a strip of old t-shirt mm -hmm. that was stretched. Mm -hmm. Um, but they had a great time with those. You can also make other types of t-shirt bags. Um, this one's just kind of gathered at the bottom. Um, and the armholes are cut out to become the handles of the bag. So that's a, a cheap and easy program because everybody has old t-shirts. And then the last thing I wanted to show is if you do apply um, at makercamp.com to become one of their affiliates for a summer camp, here's an example of some of the t-shirts that um, were sent to us, as well as pencils and stickers and little pins and lots of these little um, soldering kits um, that you can solder together a little blinking flashing pin um, of the Makey Robot. And so lots of cool things that they send you if you become a part of that. And I know with our kit we actually got the stencil that you saw on that mm -hmm. t-shirt there. And that making their own t-shirts was certainly one of the better projects too because they all got to take something home that they could wear to future Maker Camp sessions. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Thanks, right. us. That's it, unless anybody has any questions. Oh, let's see here. All right, I'm going to get our camera <laughs> back over here. Yeah. Just this. Yeah. Here, my microphone back over oh. here. Oh. Yeah. And our, our emails are available on the presentation um, if you have any questions afterwards, too, that you want to email us about. Definitely. I'm sure, yeah, if you want to go back to the presentation, get that up there. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, oh, we do have a question. While we're at it here, um, yeah, go ahead and move that place. There we go. There it is. Um, what are some of the things you wish you had thought of before starting the maker camps? 
Um, or is it different for each project? Is, um, is there some, like, before you even start this whole program, things you wish you'd known? Or is it more like each day is a different experience, yeah. I suppose? I think for me it's probably just more project by project. Um, super important to always test out your project yes. ahead of time mm -hmm. and time how much how long it takes yeah. like Joseph said you know double the time <laughs> right. um, and and just try to think of things um, that could potentially go wrong yeah, that's <laughs> um, that, right. that little um, hand cuff thing with all the LED light I had tested mine ahead of time, um, and then when it came to program day, I had this big box full of LED lights. Kids were picking out boxes, or picking out the LED lights out of the box. Um, in the box, I had a mixture of different colors of LEDs. When I had done mm -hmm. my test, I used all red LEDs. The kids mm -hmm. were picking out different colors. We found mm. that certain colors didn't work together, and they broke the circuit. Oh, so interesting! I hadn't expected that yeah. because that. I hadn't tested that ahead of time. And huh. so, just I think for me, it's more project by project, just trying mm. to think of all the different um, mm. possibilities. Yeah, I know one of the things for me is location. There are definitely some mm -hmm. projects we try to do on our main floor, so it's right there, so people can see it and get interested in it. But stuff like um, the egg drop or we made slime, those things are going to want a tile floor or like mm -hmm. a washing station of some sort nearby because they're going to be constantly mm -hmm. having messy, messy fingers. Ones, and, yeah. yeah. Um, some projects we have done outside because that's just the most convenient way. We ended up using a small inflatable pool for one of our projects mm -hmm. this month. And yeah, that definitely we wanted outside so that we didn't run the risk of so spilling water. So something, if you do this year round, figure out the ones that you need to do outside and oh, true. schedule them during the nicer year time of the year, and then all the inside ones during the winter time. Exactly. Don't want to, unless there's something winter themed down. Yeah. <laughs> so that you need to be out in the cold or use the snow for that we have here. Right. <laughs> Whichever works. All right. Um, any other questions from anybody? Last minute questions. We're a little over our 11 a.m. Mm -hmm. time, but that's okay. Um, we go as long as necessary for this until. Um, we can uh, get all your questions answered and get everything taken care of. Yep. Speaking um, of being a little over time, I always mm -hmm. think it's better to try to plan when you are timing. A little over time, you'd rather be over time than under time, at least for me. I don't want to have children come sure. in and then you know, right have 30 or 45 minutes of time. And then, mm -hmm. and then you can't finish what you've told them they're going to be able to do in that <laughs> amount of time. Yeah. Well, it doesn't look like anybody, anybody urgent questions are coming in right now. That's fine. Um, there is uh, Megan and Joseph's contact information. You can reach out to them if you do have any um, questions, thoughts on this, and anything you've done, or anything like you're saying you want to add to that Google sheet. Now, is that um, obviously I can link to, is that public for which people have to contact you to be able to have um, editing. To, uh, access to that, or how is that working? Right now, I've got it open, and we'll okay. see if we have problems. <laughs> right. Um, if if it turns out that I get people, you know, weird posting, things, are yeah, added weird things to are it, getting yeah. posted to it, then it might be where you have to contact one Definitely. of us to add to it. Sure, and that's not a problem. Yeah. All right, and I've added that to the links um, for the show. Um, then we'll see. I've got to go back and grab some of the other ones. Sure. Um, but this presentation will be up there, too, afterwards. So yeah. in one way or another, you guys will all have access to everything that um, was mentioned. So yeah, it doesn't look like anybody's typed anything desperate while we've been chatting here. So I think that um, since you guys have showed anything, we'll wrap it up for today. Great. Thank you so much. This is really fun. Um, I, I don't work in an actual library anymore. As you guys all know, I'm here at the Library Commission, but it makes me wish I did. Or like, <laughs> trying to figure out, is there a way that I can just, I mean, I'm sure I could do some of this just at home with, like, my nieces sure. and nephews and stuff. And just, yeah. you, know, feel, you know, or, you know, contact Lincoln City Libraries and say, what are you doing? I want to bring them to learn some of this kind of stuff. Because <laughs> right. they would just go crazy for these kinds yeah. of things. Or say, offer some things. adult programs with some of these. That, oh. Yeah, absolutely. Because <laughs> a lot of things, like the wearable art and stuff, I know we've that's something a lot of sometimes, because some of the wearable things, if it entails um, sewing or things, you need to have a little more dexterity and, and right. um, ability to do that. It would be either the older teens or adults wanting to. Do that. I know I have friends who have made their own things that are 
um, crafty cosplay type things and have some of his LED type things and you know R two D two hat that has the blinking lights where he has his blinking. Yeah, that's awesome. So, <laughs> all right, so we will wrap it up for today then. Thank you very much, guys, for coming and Thanks sharing. Thanks for having me. Thank you for having us. You guys were able to come here and show everything and um, come into Lincoln for you guys are not that far. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's still you know take a little morning away from the library. Um, and thank you everyone for attending. Um, the show is being recorded and will be available. Um, and I'll send you guys all the link when it's ready. Um, I should have it up and ready to go by this afternoon, um, as long as YouTube cooperates and, and everything goes quickly. Um, so we'll have that. We'll have a link to the presentation, and um, any of the websites and things that are mentioned will be in our delicious, and also the right here in the presentation as well for you to use. Um, and this will be on the website, which I will go over here, and we'll get to our and have this live site so I can show you where that's going to be and um, what's great about our show if I typed it correctly let's get this is yes, Encompass Live, except whatever this thing is, is pretty much the only <laughs> thing called that out there. So you just Google Encompass Live, you will find our site. Um, all of our archives are here and are right beneath our upcoming show list of upcoming shows, archived Encompass Live sessions. Um, and this is uh, last week's show. You can see here we had the recording, presentation links. Same thing will be up for this week's show. Um, it'll be there, and I'll send you a link to that and let you know when is it available so you can watch the recording, um, go through their slides, and go to any of the websites. Um, other than that, I hope you join us for next week where we have another um, uh, session techie related thing coding corner at your library next week's topic is um, this is uh, Marvel Maring at um, the Omaha South Omaha um, Public Library um, will be with us on the show um, they've been doing coding programs for kids um, kids teens um, they started this I this is 2014 was when they first started doing it, and um, they've been having it as an ongoing. And they're also part of the new the uh, Girls Who Code Club. Um, this is a thing, a national organization that can um, how you can have local information and project um, programs with them um, to get more girls into doing coding and computer. Um, related things. So um, join us next week for that show um, and any of our other shows that we do have coming up here um, on our schedule. I've got almost all of September on there um, and as new shows are added um, they'll be added in here so always keep checking to see what's coming up. Um, also Encompass Live is on Facebook so if you are a big Facebook user do pop over there and give us a like. Um, it slowly comes up. <laughs> uh, we uh, you, Facebook has this new thing trying to get you to log in, um, but we'll just ignore that for now. Um, you see here I do a reminder this morning of when um, to log in for today's show, when the recordings are ready I post on here, um, reminders go away, <laughs> of um, joining us for the next show, whatever the next topics are. So if you are big on Facebook, like us there and you'll get notifications of what's going on with the show. Other than that, that wraps it up for this morning. Thank you very much for attending this week's Encompass Live, and we'll hopefully we'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye-bye.